Welcome, I'm Anna Galletly, and we're going to continue talking about the integumentary system. So we're going to go over a few more things here in part two related to the epidermis, focusing most, mostly on skin cancer and, and also how we get skin color. And then I'll briefly mention albinism since it is a type of skin color and it's kind of interesting. So let's talk about cancer first. All right, so what is skin cancer? Skin cancer is when there are genetic mutations or changes that accumulate in cells sufficiently that you get abnormal um, cell division and tissue growth, okay? With any type of cancer, you're looking at the accumulation of five to six mutations that affect the regulation and the, of the particular genes that um, help with um, whether a cell will go through apoptosis or whether a cell will increase the amount of mitosis it goes through, a couple of other different things. You're gonna look at this a lot more in pathophysiology, but that's kind of like a really general um, explanation. Now, in skin cancer, what is it typically attributed to? It is typically attributed to UV radiation damage. to the DNA of the cells in your epidermis, all right? Um, so that's kind of an important thing to remember. Now, I, I personally um, think that it's an oversimplification. I think there are a lot more things involved than just UV radiation on whether or not you actually um, develop skin cancer or not, um, but that is the general, um, like most accepted explanation. All right, so UV radiation, what is it? So it's coming from our sunlight, all right? It's there, it's always there. You're gonna divide it into, you've probably already heard this, like in grade school or something, UVA and UVB. UVB, sunlight radiation stuff, is what causes sunburn. Um, and a lot of that gets blocked by your clothing, your glasses, um, shades in your house, that kind of stuff. UVA is what really does the damage to the collagen in your in your skin, um, and so so that's how they're a little bit different. Now both of them are affecting your cells. Both of them are there, okay. But I just wanted you to kind of notice how the light affects our skin differently. Um, so the cancers. Let's think about what those are. Let's do a different section and let's do a table. Sort of, not really a table. Let's do a compare and contrast. So you have squamous cell carcinoma. Um, actually, I'm gonna type right. I'm gonna pause this and I'm gonna write it out really quickly. All right. I imagine that was a little jarring, but at least you didn't have to hear me clicky clacking on the screen. So let's talk about these. So squamous cell carcinoma. Um, actually, let me draw another line right here because why not? So. There are different things I want you to be aware of with these things. With, with all of them, I want you to know where they are originating in the skin. So squamous cell carcinoma 
is going to originate when a number of keratinocyte, uh, a number of uh, mutations accumulate in the keratinocytes, mostly kind of in the stratum, granulosum. Actually, it's really more spinosum. Let's just change that. Stratum spinosum. So the stratum spinosum, it can also be granulosum, but just remember that those are getting the process of dying, so you might lose a lot of those. Um, but some work mostly in the stratum, ugh, stratum spinosum, okay? So remember that all of these cells are supposed to be going through um, basically the process of getting ready to die. So basically they're starting the process of apoptosis. They're thickening up their membranes. They're going to eventually be ejecting the organelles as they get up into the stratum granulosum. The mutation, mutations stop that natural apoptosis process so that they don't lose the organelles. And not only do they stop the natural apoptosis, but it increases the signals to go through mitosis. So then you've got cells up in the stratum spinosum potentially going through mitosis. Now remember, they're only supposed to go through mitosis in the stratum basale, okay? So that's not good. We don't want that happen. Now, so that's kind of like what you've got there. Now, let's see if we can talk about prognosis, okay? So if it is early, good outcomes, all right? This is one of the most treatable types of cancer. You can have it on your skin for several years and then they cut it out and you're fine, okay? The other kind of interesting thing about this is um, what's the cause? So we think that this one is related to sun exposure. And it's interesting in that it is found on sun exposed skin, all right? And you're gonna find out why that's interesting in just a minute, okay? Um, the basal cell carcinomas, all right, I want you to think about that name, basal cell carcinoma. So where do you think it's originating? All right, if you said the stratum basale, you would be right. So keratinocytes in stratum basale, so basal cell basale, okay? Um, so remember that these cells usually have a nice melanin umbrella, okay? But some, for some reason that gets damaged or maybe there's just so much sunlight that the melanin can't protect it and it ends up getting um, damaged, okay? Again, um, if early, this one also has good outcomes, okay? And it is also found mostly um, on sun-exposed skin, just like squamous cell carcinoma. So that's good. So both of these are dealing with keratinocytes. And keratinocytes, if you cut them out, everything seems to, to go pretty good, all right? The basal cell carcinoma is also considered the least malignant, okay? And people can have these for many years before they get caught and excised. I mean, the earlier the better, of course. But I just want to kind of emphasize that um, they don't metastasize um, quickly. All right? You can have them for a long time, and they're easy to treat. Melanoma, totally different. So this is a different type of cell. This is a cancerous cell that originates in a melanocyte. Okay? It is definitely the most dangerous. It's more likely to metastasize and spread. Okay, so it has a high me metas me metas. Oh, I'm gonna totally misspell that metastasis rate. I'm, I'm sure. Metas. I think that's right. Metastasis. Anyway, it's the most likely to metastasize. Okay, the thing that I find really interesting about this is that um, it's found on non-sun non, non 
sun exposed skin. So like with people with a lot of hair, it's found on your head or it might be found on your butt um, or it's found um, on someone who always wears a shirt and it's on their back, okay? So there's some discussion about whether this is actually a systemic reaction to sun exposure rather than over here, which would be direct exposure, direct exposure. So they think on the first two, the UV radiation is causing direct damage to the cells, whereas this is more like a systemic reaction to sun exposure. So kind of like an autoimmune issue, almost, not quite, but sort of along that, those lines. So most dangerous, you want, you definitely want melanomas caught early and excised, okay? Um, now, I'm just going to throw in here just to make y'all think and to ignore, uh, annoy people. Um, again, everybody goes on and on and on about sun exposure. And there's some interesting research. If you start digging deeper into the medical research, it doesn't get into to the regular news very much. Um, showing a link between vitamin D levels and um, rates of skin cancer. So one of the things that's interesting is that people with very pale skin in places like Arizona and New Mexico put on lots of sunscreen and stay inside so that they don't get sunburns or skin cancer. But this also causes their vitamin D levels to be very low. And there are some studies showing that vitamin D being low is associated with increased risk of all cancers, including, well not all, but many cancers, including skin cancer. So some research is suggesting that we really need to work on maintaining um, optimal vitamin D levels. Vitamin D does a lot of different things in our bodies. It's most famous for helping us absorb calcium when we eat from the foods that we eat, but it also seems to play a role in helping the immune system find and identify uh, precancerous and early cancerous cells that have broken free. Um, melanin, not melanin, sorry, uh, melatonin is also showing similar effects where it is um, having sufficient melatonin helps the immune system while you are sleeping identify precancerous cells. Another thing that's interesting is if you are not, if you are awake at night and sleeping during the day, not only are your melatonin levels low, but your vitamin D levels may also be low because of lack of sunlight. So there may be this very interesting little cycle going on. All right, um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is skin color. All right, so skin color, hair color, eye color, they're all interrelated. Um, and there are about four to six genes that control these coloration patterns. That means this is a polygenic trait which means every place where they like do these really cute things online where it's like predict what, what color eyes your child is gonna have by looking at you and your partner. Um, those don't, those can't work really because it's not a Mendelian trait. It's a polygenic trait. It's actually really, really complex. Um, to kind of try and simplify it, um, and also to make it even more complex, it can be different genes for eye color versus hair color versus skin color. Okay, now what we're going to do to simplify it is just focus instead of on the genes on the pigments. We've got three major ones, melatonin, carotene, and hemoglobin. Melanin is going to be doing your blues, uh, not blues, um, your brown blacks, all right? If you have phenomelanin, you will get reddish tones, okay, to that actual hair. Um... And that's pretty interesting to me, especially because the mutation for phenomelanin actually increases risk of UV damage to your cells by producing free radicals, all right? Whereas these two, which are controlled by eumelanin, reduce risk of UV damage. So your redheads over here are in danger of sunburns, right? Because they don't have the dark melanin. And then they're also in, da da in danger of increased cancer risk, not because they're getting sunburns, but because 
their melanin is actually producing more free radicals that damage the DNA. And I just covered up my words so that nobody can see that. Normally I write this stuff out, but I'm not, okay? Um, the other two pigments that can contribute to a much lesser degree are carotene and hemoglobin. Carotene you get from your diet. All right, so like from carrots, it gets absorbed in the stratum corneum and hypodermis, and it makes you kind of yellowish to orange. So if you got someone doing some kind of like carrot juice fast and they already have fairly light skin, it can make them start to look a bit yellow, all right? The other thing is hemoglobin. And remember, hemoglobin is in your blood, and in your skin, you have those dermal capillaries. If you do not have a lot of melanin in your skin already, you will see the pink color of your blood through the pale color of your epidermis. So you can see basically into your dermis. People with dark pigmented skin, they can see this effect on the palms of their hands, on the inside of their lips where you don't have a lot of melanin production, okay? All right, let's, um, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so when we start to think about coloration, Again, you're looking mostly at the saturation, the quantity, the type of melanin present in the skin. Remember, melanin is being secreted by melanocytes. Okay? Something else that's interesting is when you look at kids and women, they tend to have lower melanin. Okay? They are paler in color. And this has some interesting implications um, when we start to look at hypotheses for why people have different skin color, okay? Um, basically, kids and women need more vitamin D. And so because they need more vitamin D, they have less melanin because melanin blocks the production of vitamin D in your skin by blocking the UV radiation, okay? so. Kids tend to be lighter than adults. Women to be ha tend to have lighter skin color than men, okay? Um, and that relates probably to the vitamin D hypothesis, okay? Now, what about some things like blue eyes? Like, what makes your eyes blue? It is still the concentration of melanin. Basically, you have less in your eyes. So in the iris, in that smooth muscle. So there's less melanin, so the eyes appear blue because they're reflecting that part of the spectrum. Green eyes actually have more melanin than blue eyes, right? It's related um, to basically going on to being a brown eye. Um, if you may have seen people with pink eyes, where the iris is pink, not the disease, not the, the illness, pink eyes, the pink iris, okay? And that is basically means you have no melanin. So like you've seen rats with pink eyes, there are also some humans with, the, with, a, with certain types of albinism that will have a pink iris. Um, it's, often they have brown eyes um, or blue eyes, um, but sometimes they can be pink as well. All right, let's blow up our chart right here. And let's talk about this really cool thing between skin's color and natural selection, okay? So what we have on this chart that I stole somewhere online years ago is right here is our equator. The equator is where you will have the longest amount of daylight and the highest amounts of UV radiation hitting the skin. The exception will be people living at really high altitude. If you're at high altitude, you will have also more UV radiation because you don't have the atmosphere protecting you from it. What you find is when you look at human breeding populations before we did a lot of traveling by airplane and moving around and a lot of immigration, all right, you will see that in between the two tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, I think I did that backwards, Cap um, anyway, it doesn't matter, between this section where we have the highest amount of UV radiation on the earth, people have the darkest skin, skin color. Africa being the birthplace of anatomically modern humans, you can see these folks have the darkest skin colors. As you move upwards this way and down this way, it changes. So humans immigrated out this way and this way into Europe 
and Asia. As they did that, it got colder and they started wearing more clothing. And in the winter, you know, they might only have three to five hours of, sun of sunlight a day. And so they don't have a lot of skin exposure. You need the skin to be exposed to sunlight in order to make vitamin D. If you don't make enough vitamin D as a child, you get rickets. When you get rickets, you get bowed legs. In a girl, in a woman who had rickets as a girl, her pelvis is also bowed. She cannot give natural childbirth, vaginal childbirth, without dying. All right, You can't get it out because the bones are collapsed. Um, so women who had rickets as a child would die before giving birth. So that's selected for women with darker skin, excuse me, with lighter skin, so that they produced more vitamin D. And you see this pattern across here. So people migrated across Asia this way and then into North America. And if you look at the Native American populations, they have lighter skin up here. And then remember, they're coming this way in over several thousand years, they came down this way. Now we're getting more UV radiation. These folks are getting selected for darker skin again. And you can see that down here. And then you can see it starts to get a little bit lighter as you get further away. Also, you have high altitudes up here. So why did these folks go from being very light back to having darker? Not as dark as Africa, but still darker. Well, women also, actually all humans produce folate, all right? Folic acid, it's in our bodies. Folic acid is damaged by UV radiation. Women who have damaged folic acid, so they are deficient in folic acid, those of us who have been pregnant or are trying to get pregnant know we were told to take folic acid supplements. Because if you are deficient in folic acid, you get birth defects. Um, and potentially the child doesn't die. So women who had darker skin were selected for um, in these areas because their children were less likely to have birth defects. Okay? And in one of our discussion posts, I have a really fun, cool thing for y'all to do where you look at the uh, video where they talk about this and the original research where this hypothesis really got good evidence to support it. Um, it's it was pretty exciting stuff when it first came out. I, I remember when it was first published. It was pretty exciting. Okay. All right. Um, on the next slide, I believe I have um, more reading for you. Let me see. Wait a minute. Um, that next slide, the potential reasons why. I wrote down many potential reasons why on a slide that you will found, find in your PowerPoint. So you can go and look at that if you want to see a little bit more about some of those. Okay. Um, the cold injury hypothesis, I'm not going to spend time talking about it, but if you were in my on-campus class, I would tell you that it was a hypothesis that was disproved. It was basically a racist hypothesis, which should have you very curious now and now Googling it to see what it is, okay? But just remember, it's not, um, it was disproved. So the cold injury hypothesis is BS. All right, let's talk about albinism. All right, albinism is really cool. It's interesting. Um, what, uh, what do I find interesting about it? Well, first of all, there are 14 different types and they're due to different genetic mutations. Um, one of the things I find really interesting about it is that it's been affected by cultural selection, which basically means in some areas of the world, in some communities, albinism was seen favorably. It was seen as powerful, as cool. So people who were born with albinism got to have lots of babies um, because they were considered really hot or magical or important. And so then you just have higher rates of albinism in certain populations. So in Europe, it wasn't seen as cool. So it's like one in 20,000. Part, some communities in West Africa, it's like one in 2,000. And then um, among the Kuna, which live in uh, Panama, and the Hopi in New Mexico, it's like one in 100, 146 live births, which is a really high rate. So I find it really interesting that, that um, how it's been so dramatically affected by cultural selection. So basically, what is albinism now that I've gone on, on and on about cultural selection? Albinism is going to be a mutation that affects melanocytes, but it can affect it in different places. 
And when it does affect the melanocytes, um, and basically you're not producing the melanin or you're not converting certain enzymes into melanin, it's gonna result in folks like this gentleman who basically have much lighter skin, much lighter hair. Um, the eyes, the iris will be lighter. So it could be a gray or blue. In some ex more extreme case cases, it can be a pink color. All right, um, the next slide I think I have a cute picture of a monkey and one of the two of the more common causes. Let's look at that. All right, we see albumin, albinism not just in humans. All right, so here is my adorable monkey and you can see he's got the red eyes. Is it he? I can't see, his feet are in the way. Um, red eyes, rats have a type of albinism with red eyes as well. So what cause, so some, the most common causes. So there's a recessive allele that affects tyrosinase enzyme basically the tyrosinase tyr tyrosinase is not converted into tyrosine which is not converted into melanin so you need this to make this and if you don't have it then you basically have a type of albinism the other cause of albinism which i think is really cool because i like cats i like cats a lot Okay, not crazy, like I only have one cat, so it's not like 20 cat likes, but I like cats a lot, okay? Basically, in this case, the mutation, you've got the tear sneeze, but you don't convert it, okay? And the reason you don't convert it is because it is heat sensitive. So if you look at your Siamese cats and you look at their ears and their feet, they are a darker color than the rest of their body. So basically, if you feel your ears and feet on a cold day, you'll notice that they feel colder than your chest. So because your chest is warm and your face is warm, the tyrosinase does not convert into melanin. And because your ears are cold and the heat isn't damaging the enzyme, they do convert. So you get darker ears and darker feet and a lighter chest body and face, and head, okay? I don't know, I just think that's really cool. Um, all right, that's it for skin issues. And we will stop the recording here and you can go take a break and then move on to the next part.